It's great to be here with you today, and it's been a terrific morning learning about the opportunities in cell therapy, particularly in neurodegenerative diseases, which are complex diseases with interesting clinical phenotypes and difficult challenges in assessing outcome. I have a distinguished group of panelists with me here today. Uh, we've got also the, the opportunity to introduce you to Erwin Bazard, who's our interim research director at the Institute for Neurodegenerative Disorders. Uh, Nicola Kojic, who is the CEO and co-founder of Orion Cell Therapies, glad to have you here. Uh, Jeff Mackay, who's president and CV, uh, CEO of Avro Bio uh, here in Cambridge, Mass. And Vivian Tabar, who's a founding investigator at Blue Rock Therapeutics and also the chair of neurosurgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Each of these panelists are working in the area of neurodegenerative disorders and cell and gene-based therapeutics. I'd like to start off and ask the group, uh, Perhaps we can comment on this issue of neurodegeneration because it implies a slope of clinical and phenotypic decline. Is our goal here mitigation, or do we think that there is an opportunity for reversal of some of these neurological phenotypes and symptoms? And uh, you know, perhaps, uh, Jeff, you'd like to kick us off on that. Yeah, sure, thank you. So, uh, of, of course, the, the prime goal of, of gene therapy, which is what my company is focused on, is to prevent symptoms from developing in the first place. Uh, we, we do hold out hope that if there's not gross neurodegeneration, there may even be certain settings where there's a potential for reversal. But the, the main goal is to prevent the, the uh, effects from manifesting in the first place. And, and I would say that, that, that there is clinical proof of concept for this hope already established. And you know, one, one of the uh, indications that we like to point to is metachromatic leukodystrophy from Orchard, where there already is EMA European approval for a, an ex vivo lentigene therapy targeting these toddlers that do experience really rapid neurodegeneration. And the, the clinical effect is, is not only profound, uh, but really durable. And, and now the, the effect has been documented after a single infusion to go out 10 plus years where we're really able to see a, a stabilization, a prevention of, of symptoms to manifest. And the timing of this conference is actually wonderful because uh, another important proof of concept is in um, cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. And 20 years into the research, just a few hours ago, Bluebird Bio announced uh, the CHMP uh, positive opinion, which is basically the precursor for a, a European approval for their ex vivo lentigene therapy in, in uh, cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. And that data shows a, a similar profound effect where I believe 27 out of 30 patients going out as far as seven years after that single if, if infusion are showing that stabilization of progression in, in these kids. And there's, of course, some other ear earlier stage data in diseases like uh, MPS2A. So we, we, we're at an exciting time where, you know, decades of research are beginning to translate. But I think that the, the, the primary goal is to prevent symptoms from developing in the first place and maybe in select occasions where there's not that gross neurodegeneration to see some signs of reversal. Thank you. That's uh, important uh, and exciting new developments as well. Well, let me toss it out to the other panelists in terms of thinking about mitigation versus restoration and even the concept of broad-based delivery, uh, as we've heard for some of the disorders that have been discussed, or focal delivery. Uh, can we restore a network that is declining, uh, such as in the case of Parkinson's? And uh, please uh, jump in, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, we could have Nick uh, and Vivian give us a shout out about that. Great. Uh, so I'll jump in. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, so for, uh, from, from Orion's perspective, um, what we really believe is that uh, there is a regenerative potential to really restore the missing synapses uh, that you heard in Penny Hallett's talk previously, <clears throat> talk about how these uh, synapses get destroyed and how that leads to a lot of the symptoms that occur, gross motor symptoms. And I think, you know, to, to me, the um, interesting thing about Parkinson's disease is that it, uh, the main motor 
complications are due to the death of dopaminergic neurons, which then lose the synapses with the striatal neurons, uh, important in making that neuro, uh, neurocircuitry. Now, the great, to me, the great promise of cell therapy, and particularly we're interested in autologous cell therapy that I know we'll talk about a little later, <clears throat> is this idea that um, once, uh, if we take the patient's own cells, transform them into immature dopaminergic neurons, they can be then placed focally to your to answer the question, they can be placed focally in the neighborhood of uh, the striatal neurons, and they have an inherent capability, and they basically are programmed to find the striatal neurons uh, on their own um, and form the missing synapses. Once this occurs, I think that's what was said uh, in the previous talk uh, and earlier, is that once the synapses can reform and regenerate, and this is why we think this, re this is a true, a true regenerative approach, then uh, there can be a reestablishment of the neural circuitry and actually an, uh, not only in, uh, um, uh, a mitigation of some of the symptoms, but a, uh, a really a transformative uh, uh, approach towards getting back to a previous state of Parkinson's, a much better state of Parkinson's than today. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to that um, discussion of autologous cell therapy in, in just a bit. But let me segue for a moment to Erwin, because Erwin, I know you've uh, worked a lot on the concept of network uh, effects in Parkinson's. So what is your take on this concept of a focally delivered cell product having a positive network effect? I think I mean, the proof has been broke uh, for many years uh, that uh, the focal delivery of uh, of dopamine uh, into the striatum is uh, enabling the reversal of the Parkinsonism in, uh, in Parkinsonian patients. On top of that, uh, the striking discovery that uh, deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus or uh, even lesion of the subthalamic nucleus, so a tiny structure located at the, uh, uh, at the basis of the, of the brain, is capable of restoring the normal uh, behavioral function in, uh, in Parkinson patient. And this has demonstrated clearly that the focal action on a quite complex network is capable of uh, improving the symptomatology of Parkinson's disease. So there is clearly uh, no conceptual roadblock for the focal delivery of cells into the skeleton for providing dopamine. Uh, I am However, a bit more cautious with the concept of uh, restoration or protection of the of further degeneration. This would be uh, likely the consequence of uh, multiple approaches, and we can think of the uh, of one uh, cell replacement therapy into the skeleton combined with gene therapy in order to fight against the pathogenic mechanism at work and responsible for the. Uh, death of neurons, not simply dopamine neurons, into the brain of these, of these patients. That's great. I think this is a, you know, an important concept about delivery, and when we think about delivery, we think about the strategies to do the best delivery, uh, the safest and the most efficacious in terms of survival of the, in this case, the cell product, or perhaps a more broad-based delivery in case of a gene product. Uh, Vivian, you've thought a lot about delivery. Uh, could you give us some thoughts on strategies for uh, putting these cell products in. You're, you're a surgeon and, and you've given a lot of consideration to this. Are there, is there room for technological advancement in this, in this space? Yes, thank you, Bob. So as you know, we have just opened uh, our phase one trial for um, embryonic stem cell derived dopamine neurons and uh, about to perform the first patient. So delivery is a component that we thought about a lot. And what is very obvious is that the current market does not really have the capacity to support uh, small vol volume handling, um, uh, uh, automated cell preparation, uh, problems with uh, loading cells and ascertainment of dose delivery became really um, a significant challenge uh, so that our product is an IND for both drug and device because we had to alter existing devices taking into consideration the need to um, have compatibility with surgical navigation systems. So as some of you may know, neurosurgeons really depend 
on advanced technology to visualize the target in the brain and confirm that they have reached the target uh, for whatever purpose, in this case, delivery of cells in the putamen. Uh, delivery in multiple deposits is necessary to innervate the entire putamen and avoid hotspots. So I feel that there is room for further technological development because that um, is not something you want your, your, uh, your uh, trial to fail. Uh, due to delivery issues. Congratulations on the opening of your trial and the approvals associated Thank with you. that. We know that the regulatory process can be challenging and we'll come back to that in just a moment. But while we're on the topic of the trial that you've opened and also uh, considering some of the work that Nick has talked about in terms of autologous therapy, could the two of you briefly highlight for us in the audience uh, the strategic implications of an allogeneic approach versus an autologous approach? And maybe back to you, Vivian, for uh, highlighting on the, on the allogeneic approach. Yeah, so our cells are allogeneic, and I think the advantages um, have mostly to do with cost and efficiency. So we developed a cryopreserved off-the-shelf product, so conceivably we can ship vials anywhere that will have to be sawed locally and injected. Um, since you can, you have the capacity of scaling up and making a very large batch, we also have the confidence that this batch has been extensively tested um, in animals. So the very same batch you're taking to the clinic would have undergone testing in hundreds of animals, making it uh, basically a lot more practical and cost efficient. Um, of course, we have to immune suppress the patient for a period of time to avoid potential graft rejection. In our case, we're doing it with rather mild uh, immune suppression for about a year. I would argue um, that the allogeneic approach would offer uh, some safety advantage due to the issue of uh, more extensive uh, testing. I would also imagine that uh, once you bring it up to large scale, there you may face issues in the ability to robustly uh, differentiate lines from different backgrounds into dopaminergic neurons. And of course, the pathophysiology of sporadic PD remains not fully clear. So you have to wonder about the genetic background of the IPS line that you derive from the Parkinsonian pa uh, patient, and therefore its suitability to uh, differentiate into a dopamine neuron. Um, but but the, uh, the uh, autologous approach also has its advantages, and I'm sure Nick will uh, would comment on that. Thank you, Nick. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, absolutely. Um, well, you, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Tabar laid out very nicely, you know, the advantages of the ALO approach. And I think both are uh, the wave of the future. So uh, I want to point out what we think are the strengths with the autologous approach, which for me really represents uh, a true personalized regenerative medicine approach, really, because it doesn't get any more personal than taking the patient's own cells. In our case, we want to do a blood cell transform that into the cell product, the dopaminergic neuron. And, you know, our, our really uh, passion for the autologous approach is we really feel that will have the best outcome in patients, right? Because taking the patient's own cells, putting it back in, to me is the most natural, let's say, let's call it physiological approach in my mind. Um, now, there's also, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned in the previous talk, the, there was, um, uh, it was also mentioned that data on the primates, and there was a recent study that just came out that compared these two approaches, uh, really showed that you know the autologous approach seemed to be a, a much more efficacious in these primate models. And now the big question really to me becomes about the manufacturing side. And I also, before, before I just mentioned that, I also wanted to mention the, this idea of not immunosuppressing patients could be important in an elderly population as is the Parkinson case. It really, I think that's a big, uh, potentially plus for uh, a, a solid subgroup of patients, not all, but a subgroup. Now, in terms of you know the 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 cost in manufacturing, uh, which was rightfully pointed out, that's the big question mark. Um, in our approach, we've been thinking about this a lot, and uh, really, the we, even with the technologies of today that are working on these uh, smaller modular systems, even the technologies of today, we feel like by the time. Uh, the, the, this comes to market in the coming years, uh, this technology is going to keep improving and thus will be absolutely scalable and really give the uh, ALO approach a run for their money in terms of cost, uh, I think, and scalability. Plus, I just want to point out the advantages of a modular approach 
uh, really uh, allow for constant improvements to be done in real time. They require much less upfront costs, you know, instead of building a big factory, for example. And, and the issues with having a big factory, which is, you know, standard approach, uh, and, you know, uh, which is definitely one approach, is as you, if, if we just recall, uh, Genzyme, for example, was a, was a behemoth here that was brought down by contamination issues in their factory, really, and that had to be sold to Sanofi. And more recently, Emergent, also with this COVID, you know, Johnson & Johnson mess up that they did, really highlights that even in big systems, you know, it, there, are, there are real, real risks involved. And I think we avoid that with a modular, nimble approach that can be integrated very easily and scaled up. Let's, tr let's transition for a moment and uh, back to uh, Nick and Jeff. You know, we, we, we've talked about two different phases of disease. One, a, a neurodegenerative disease of the elderly, uh, where regulatory bodies often might say, let's focus on a more advanced patient. Uh, but let's ask uh, you, Jeff, you know, should we make the case for earlier intervention in disease and even approval for some treatments of patients at earlier phases? How much data do we need in the more advanced patients before we bring it a little bit earlier? And then also maybe have Erwin follow with, are there advantages again from the network restoration of thinking about earlier intervention? So, so Jeff. Yeah, I, <clears throat> our, our, our experience is that it, it really is disease dependent, you know, because we're, we're, for example, targeting six different lysosomal disorders. And some of these are more or less serious than others. Some of them manifest later in, in age and, and have a more aggressive slope. So if we think of really serious diseases like Gaucher disease type three or early onset Pompa disease or Hunter disease, the goal is to, to treat early, treat fast, treat young, as young as possible, because if you don't, these, kid, these kids have no hope. I think that regulators are quite aligned with that because there really are no other alternatives. In some of our diseases, like Fabry disease or Gaucher disease type 1, there's a more conservative regulatory approach where you would start with adults where, unfortunately, the disease has manifested for several years. And only once you've shown that the therapy can be safe, efficacious, well tolerated in that population can you migrate down to, to earlier treatment. So, I, you know, we, we take our guidance from regulators. I mean, I think we would, the whole vision of gene therapy is to treat before damage occurs and, and hopefully just redefine the entire course of the disease with the hope of negating it altogether. But the path to get there is really dictated by, by how the disease manifests and how regulators want you to, to proceed in clinical development. Erwin, follow on thoughts on that? See, the big, the big question is, uh, I think that everyone will agree that the earlier we treat patients, the better, the better it is. But here, there is a gap between uh, what is the load or what is paid by the different healthcare systems and uh, what is scientifically uh, uh, conceivable. And uh, scientifically speaking, uh, there is no conceptual barrier for treating as early as possible the patient. There are many examples into which we know that the misplasticity that would uh, inevitably uh, results from the ongoing neurodegenerative process will be uh, less dramatic if we graft or administer gene therapies uh, as early as possible. Thank you. Uh, so in, in thinking about the, from the patient's view and or perhaps uh, even our regulatory body's review, uh, when we think about success, how do we define success? Are there biomarkers of success that can give us earlier cues about uh, positive outcomes in these patients and just open it up broadly to the panel. Uh, tell us about the key biomarkers of success that you're focused on. So maybe I can start by just saying practically for our trial, um, you know, we struggled with this question because uh, really powerful biomarkers for success in Parkinson's you know, remain in their early stages. So other than uh, plain imaging and uh, say fluorodopa PET imaging and maybe consideration of imaging, uh, PET imaging for inflammatory uh, markers, we have relatively little to go by other than traditional patient examinations with all that entails and monitoring of medications, et cetera. We are getting excited about the possibility of long-term dynamic data that could be obtained from wearables, say, 
Um, but that really uh, needs quite a bit more time to be established as a validated way to follow um, patients with Parkinson's disease. But I feel that that is a space where much more investment is required. Uh, you know, we're promising a single time therapy, be it uh, cell or com combination of cell and gene therapy, uh, with some risk that today remains unknown until we've had more patients grafted with uh, autologous or allogeneic uh, dopamine neurons. And yet we have very little to answer to the patient when they ask, what should I be expecting, except sort of general um, comments. I think uh, there's the question of graft survival, that we should be able to develop technologies to confirm uh, persistent and survival of cells. And then we should be able to uh, develop technologies to better interrogate the physiology of the circuitry that we're hoping to restore. But I, I feel that there, this is a, um, a field that's ripe for, for more assertive innovation. Thank you. Uh, enabling technologies in terms of uh, fine uh, capture of, of patients, uh, in the case of perhaps Parkinson's, uh, movements uh, during the day uh, through uh, devices or wearable devices, I think, are coming along as well, and that might give some insight into the, the clinical perspectives. Um, Jeff, you have a unique situation where you're delivering a broad-based gene product systemically. What about biomarkers for you? Uh, what, what can we look for besides the clinical outcome? I, I think one of the major benefits of gene therapy is that you need to target, you don't need to target a single hypothesis. For example, you know, in Alzheimer's, it might be an amyloid antibodies. Whereas the, the beauty of gene therapy is that you simply need to know what is the abnormal gene and where, where does it need to go. And so part of what we rely on with biomarkers is, is just that, is, is looking at things like vector copy number, have we adequately engrafted into the, the you know, hard to reach compartment uh, and are, are we seeing that type of early effect? We can look at things like impact on white matter lesions, G case activity, depending on our various diseases. But all, all that does is it informs us in a phase one, two study, we, we understand that for eventual registration, what we'll need to look at is something more than these biomarkers. And, and of course the challenge is that FDA is perfectly willing to approve based on a biomarker as a registrational primary endpoint, but only if you've correlated it with eventual functional benefit, long-term functional benefit. And in the majority of the diseases that we're talking about, that, that hasn't been established. And so the, the biomarkers are critically essential for us to understand, is the gene therapy where it needs to be? Has it engrafted? Is it expressing protein? Are we seeing some of the early effects? But all, all that does is it helps us design longer term trials. Let me, let me help us wrap up with one punctuation mark question. Um, this has been a, a terrific session. As we think about these early days of cell therapy for neurodegenerative disorders and some of the early approvals that we've heard about today, but also the launch of new trials, what is our best communication to the patient community in terms of what to expect in the next few years as it relates to these therapies? And, uh, and how should we help uh, our, our patients really understand what are the opportunities here, but manage those expectations? And again, open it up to anybody on the panel. Well, well Bob, one of the great experiences we had in the early days, even during the very early preclinical days, is involving patients, patients advocates. Uh, the Parkinson community in particular is well organized. There are numerous patient groups and organizations who communicate regularly. I found the Parkinson patients to uh, be particularly interested in in change, in new technologies, and particularly well-educated, I would think. So I think involving the patients early and educating early, we found this partnership to be incredibly valuable uh, to the scientists uh, as well as to the clinicians. So that would be sort of the, the first thing to do. And now there's enough technology, I think, to allow us to put in a greater effort in educating the patient on expectations. We should recall that uh, we, we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but Parkinson's disease is also a microenvironment disease. So with the excitement about grafts, we have to also think about the challenges of uh, the fact that the disease course is ongoing and the need to ameliorate that, to combine it with our restoration therapies 
And it's only fair and uh, also crucially important to explain the complexities uh, of the approach and the excitement at the same time uh, to patients and to patient advocates. I want, to th I want to thank you and thank the entire panel for a, a truly great session. really appreciate your insights and your remarks today.